Okay, so I'm going to be talking about some of the ways in which women in midlife are misunderstood, misdiagnosed, or missed altogether, and uh, as well as how these hormonal changes that happen in midlife uh, impact the brain and make some of us feel like we're having early Alzheimer's. And then we're going to learn uh, more about redefining yourselves if you are a woman with ADHD uh, through your strengths and not your weaknesses so that you don't um, underestimate some of the strengths you still possess and only focus on the things you struggle with. Um, I'm going to be teaching you the basics of some of the ways in which we can optimize your brain functioning, including proper sleep, nutrition, exercise, meditation, and stress management. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about executive functioning strategies and some lifestyle modifications and cognitive behavioral strategies as well. Many of you will go to a doctor potentially saying you're really stressed or overwhelmed. Those are sort of the key phrases that I listen for and I ask doctors to do the same because often it is as a result of misdiagnosed underlying ADHD. Unfortunately, what the doctors see is the stress and the overwhelm and they label that as anxiety and they might then be willing to treat the anxiety with an SSRI or something like that. Um, however, that doesn't really address the underlying ADHD. So then the woman is left feeling like she's not really understood, she's not really being treated, um, and what's wrong with me? So that's not a fun place to be. So some of the mixed misdiagnoses for women commonly are bipolar disorder, because some doctors misunderstand the sort of mood changes that can come with ADHD, but they're quite different in quality and duration and onset than those experienced in bipolar disorder. Um, same thing with borderline personality disorder and depression and anxiety in general and panic attacks. All of those have some overlapping symptoms, but they are absolutely not the same thing. They can co-occur, of course, but the actual ADHD is quite different and needs to be addressed differently. So what happens in midlife is that sometimes there are more pressures on, on women then, in addition to the hormonal changes. And when they're younger, they may have more structure in place to help them manage their ADHD. Um, and they may also have less on their plate. So when you have a family, you in a sense are having structure created for you as, to some degree to get your kids off to school and pick them up and give them dinner and take them to, to their activities that provides some structure. And by midlife though, uh, often women are in the sort of pinnacle of their careers. They might have more demands there. They may have the demands of taking care of aging parents as well as very active children going multiple directions every day. And then there is the onset of the hormonal changes. And that's really a 10 year period where you go through perimenopause and menopause. It can take a number of years for that transition to happen and it is, throughout that period that the hormones are really exacerbating some of these struggles for people. And then women become ashamed and embarrassed because we can't keep up with responsibilities and feel badly about ourselves. So women, again, are missed earlier for a number of reasons. Um, one is that they tend to be somewhat less disruptive. They tend to be more eager to please, to do well, both to please teachers and to please parents. Uh, they tend to be um, less often hyper, and when they are hyper, it's more taking the form of talking to their neighbor too much, being a chatty Cathy type. Um, and they tend to try harder to hide their struggles or compensate for them uh, because of their desire to please. And then when you have an overlapping sort of tendency to, to be perfectionistic, then that can compensate to a large degree, but it will be at a cost. So the individual will still struggle, but it won't be as evident. So women have so many demands on them societally, stereotypically, to from starting with running the household, all aspects of that, cooking, cleaning, laundry, grocery shopping. These are very much multi-step tasks that require a lot of executive functioning and time management, managing the children, their school, their homework, their doctor visits, their sports activity, their sports and social activities, et cetera. And especially when you have more than one, that becomes exponentially more challenging. And then the family social calendar, running the kids' events, um, the, the parents' events, holidays, friends, a uh, couple friends, et cetera. 
And then, um, as I alluded to before, often we have aging parents to some degree who need some support. And many of us are also working outside the home. So we have a full-time job on top of all of this. So that is really a lot on one's plate in midlife for many. So as a result of that, women who struggle with their ADHD in midlife tend to feel ashamed and inadequate because they aren't really able to fulfill the gender roles that they feel are expected of them as a mother, a wife, a homemaker, um, and, and even an, uh, an employee. So they take on too much and their executive functioning uh, demands just overwhelm the circuit, so to speak, and makes everything more challenging. Um, so it's the stress and the overwhelm of managing all of that that can lead to the anxiety and the depression that the doctors then notice when women go in complaining that they're overwhelmed. Um, but that's really not the underlying cause. And then there's feelings of failure and guilt, as well as stress, um, even in the marriage, because some husbands, and this has happened to clients that I know, have actually threatened to leave their wives as a result of their perceived inadequacies by their husbands which is quite sad. So it's really important that women with ADHD get all the support they can um, before it impacts things too badly. So the perception as a moral deficit versus a neurodevelopmental disorder can really affect how women experience their symptoms. There's so much more of a social stigma um, involved when people believe that it's sort of a laziness or it's a lack of effort or interest as opposed to a true neurodevelopmental difference. Um, and women who are not diagnosed until adulthood are more likely to also suffer from depression, anxiety, sleep issues, eating disorders, substance abuse, and low self-esteem. The research has found fairly recently. Um, and then a late or a misdiagnosis is often associated with difficulties in being consistent as a parent, problems in managing jobs and households, conflicts at home, at school, at work, a reduced quality of life, and an increased risk of divorce and single parenting. So prior to this diagnosis, many women would blame themselves and their struggles on personal flaws, like laziness or lack of effort, resulting in a, in self, in a very negative self-image. Um, and they, you know, compensatory work efforts, high IQ, and a structured and supportive home and school environment can contribute to keeping ADHD hidden for many years, uh, while the inconsistent performances are instead attributed to perceived personal flaws, uh, leading to self-blame and low self-esteem. So this again is all based on research as well as personal experience and anecdotes in a lot of the clients that I have served. So women desperately need appropriate medical and psychosocial treatment for their ADHD, leading to better self-understanding and improved functioning. And just even giving them a diagnosis definitively can really be therapeutic in their sense of self and their re-envisioning of who they are through that lens instead of blaming and shaming themselves. So research results have shown that estradiol, which is a variation of estrogen status, um, does impact working memory functioning. Uh, minor fluctuations in dopamine can profoundly alter working memory as well. And that's one of the underpinning issues with the biochemistry of ADHD is a lack of dopamine availability. So that's why the working memory is such a common um, area of difficulty. Estrogen receptors are widely distributed in the brain, but are found to be concentrated in the hippocampus, which is where our memory centers are located, implicating effects on episodic memory functioning. So here's some just hard evidence about the direct impact of changes in the estrogen levels on actual cognitive functioning for women with ADHD. So midlife onset executive function difficulties um, are common, but they are far worse in women with the pre-existing or previously sub-threshold ADHD. And what I mean by that is ADHD exists on a continuum. You can have a, a sort of minor amount, you can have a more significant amount, you can have everything in between. And when you hit a certain point, you are given the diagnosis, but you can be subclinical, which means that you have many of the symptoms, but you don't fully meet criteria for the diagnosis. And sometimes the onset of perimenopause can then push you kind of over that point of now more fully meeting criteria for the diagnosis. So memory complaints during or after menopause transitions are common for everyone, 
um, including about 60% of middle-aged women. Um, and 42% of postmenopausal women reported a negative change in their cognitions according to this study. So it is common in all women, but as I'm trying to point out to you, because of where the estrogen receptors are located, it really does exacerbate the underlying ADHD. So these results suggest also that early life adversity has lasting impacts on large scale functional networks underlying executive functioning. So these alterations um, can also be negatively impacted by early adverse events. Um, and a lot of people with ADHD are more at risk for these early adverse events because of their ADHD. They more often are sort of subjected to environments that are chaotic and sometimes traumatic. Um, they are often more often bullied. They're more often um, sort of found to be lacking and are criticized and often you know, feel very badly about themselves. So these negative impacts in their lives actually impact their brain development. So this contributes to it as well. So these hormone related brain changes um, magnify what were previously more subtle and manageable ADHD symptoms. And this kind of serves as the tipping point for many people in midlife causing women um, increased distress, which then results in them finally seeking care, although it's often the stress that gets medicated. Um, so they really need a lot of reassurance and psychoeducation and support to better understand their neurology and not keep blaming themselves for being inadequate. It's so important that physicians recognize and screen potential underlying ADHD in women when they come complaining about stress or overwhelm. Um, again, those are the hallmarks. And, that's why I call this frenzied, frazzled, and overwhelmed, because those are common terms that women ex sort of identify with as a way to sort of um, identify what they're going through. And those words, to me, are code words for ADHD. So too many women are made to feel like they're diseased, something's wrong with them, um, and they're only treated for the depression and the anxiety that's secondary to the untreated ADHD. So secondary means that it's as a result of the ADHD that's not treated and the stress um, that it causes for one to live with untreated ADD and try to make everything walk, work, work for yourself and keep all the balls in the air um, is extremely stressful. So that's what ends up getting identified first. Or they get mistreated, misdiagnosed with the wrong disorder, um, anxiety being one of them, but also sometimes bipolar or other things. So it is fundamentally a, a, a chemical problem. There's a lack of dopamine availability and it affects emotional regulation as well, which not everyone is aware of. Not only is it cognitive functioning and executive functioning, but it's also emotional regulation. Because there's a lack of dopamine availability, the part of the brain that would normally regulate emotions at the higher uh, sort of cerebral cortex level is not online. And so it's easy to get emotionally reactive and feel more sensitive and dysregulated emotionally as a result of not having a fully sort of activated frontal lobe. Um, so the most effective treatment is actually to change the chemistry with medication. Unless the problematic chemistry is changed, other interventions are less likely to be effective. So it's a combination of pills and skills, as we say. Um, so women in midlife have been found to respond well to medication for ADHD. It's not just for younger people. So here's a cartoon image of what is going on chemically at the uh, receptor site in the brain. So the top is a neuron that is the sending one, and it is releasing micro dots of chemical, the red dots, in this case, dopamine across the synapse or gap between the neurons. And ideally it hits the receptor sites on the receiving neuron. And that is how messages get passed around in the brain. However, with the ADHD brain, what's happening is that a certain amount of the dopamine is not actually crossing over completely before the transporter protein, that green thing, attaches to it and brings it back into the same neuron that has just released it. It gets repackaged in these little vesicles, the little packages, and then re-released again. That is called a reuptake process where it is in effect being trapped and there is less available dopamine to cross over um, and fire the next neuron. And what I want you to see before we move on is 
that what medications do is they stop the transporter protein, the green thing, from attaching to the dopamine and bringing it back into the same neuron that just released it. So that will allow more available dopamine at the synapse. Some medications, in addition to that, will also add additional dopamine to the synapse. Those are the double action ones in the amphetamine category. So here's an example of how the brain can look different with no medication versus, in this case, Adderall. So you can see what look like holes in the upper part, which are the frontal lobes. On the one with no medication, they are much larger. The holes represent areas of underactivation, i.e. an area with not enough dopamine or glucose metabolism going on. So you can see that area is significantly reduced in the brain that's treated. So what, this is what we look for and expect to see when we have an adequate level of clinical, um, of um, stimulant medication on board. So we wanna see an improved attention span, decreased distractibility, improved ability to start tasks and complete them, which then increases productivity, um, enhanced short-term or working memory, and more efficiency, faster processing speed, um, better ability to read materials more efficiently without having to reread it multiple times in order to retain the, and process the information and reduce risk-taking. So there's driving safety here, better choices, less impulsivity. Next slide. Also, a de definitely a decreased sense of being overwhelmed. And as some clients will describe, it's as if all of the multiple radio stations in their head have been narrowed down to one station at a time that they can focus on. There is also increased patience and tolerance. Again, that's the emotional part because the brain is better activated. It can manage emotions when you have them. So you're less likely to feel impatient or easily frustrated. Um, there is a diminished need for stimulation seeking because when you're not treated, the brain is bored chemically and looking for stimulation and looking for a dopamine hit. So a lot of the stimulation seeking behaviors, whether that be a video game, a game on your phone, or food even, um, those are activities that will sort of um, stimulate your brain temporarily. Um, that you're gonna see less of once you're treated um, and reduce your secondary anxiety and depression. And as a result of all that, enhances self-esteem, confidence, and communication, communication skills. So you can find your words better and feel a little more um, sort of able to articulate. So active medication management, however, is really essential to this process. Too many women get given a script by their doctor and not really much guidance in how to make sure the medication is working for them. So I do a lot of that work with my clients. So first there's of course developing the habit to remember to take it because that's a new habit if you're not used to taking medication already. This can be something that's easily forgotten or missed. Um, so I help women learn how to do that, building some accountability and set reminders and that kind of thing. And then monitoring it is so important. Um, what to do if you get certain side effects, whether that means you need to change medication or not, or there's some ways, sometimes the timing can reduce side effects or the dose level can reduce side effects by lowering the dose. So there's a lot of details about managing it that really need to be addressed by, by a physician or a therapist because Getting it right is really an, kind of an art form to some degree, and many doctors don't seem to have the time to need it to kind of go into those details. So communicating regularly, any feedback you can to your medicating physician is going to be really important to get it right. So a lot of times adults are under-medicated. Um, obviously, we don't want to over-medicate, but too often they're given a, a very low dose and it's not increased. In fact, I had a, a child even who that was true for for two years she was at the lowest dose of a medication and it was never ever increased and it just wasn't a very effective it was um she was not at the clinically significant level yet also for women when you are still having cycles um you will potentially experience variability in the efficacy of your medication as your um, cycle changes so that's, again, due to the effects of estrogen on attention, memory, and mood. Um, lack of sleep, stress, and depression can also negatively impact the efficacy of the medication. So if your medication is not working, you really need to first look at sleep, look at hormonal changes and fluctuations, and also look at stress levels. And some clients 
may have some medical reasons to not be able to tolerate stimulants such as high blood pressure. So sometimes uh, it's necessary to get evaluated if you have certain heart defects or very high blood pressure. Making the time to prioritize you is so essential. So many, many women that I see put themselves last. They feel so inadequate just trying to keep up with all the demands in their lives that what they do is sacrifice themselves. So if they're lucky, they'll get a few minutes left at the end of the day to do something for themselves uh, because they're, they're so busy taking care of all the other responsibilities. And that is really, excuse my French, ass backwards. You have to be number one. And the only way you can actually take care of all your responsibilities is to put fuel in your tank. Because if you're running on empty, if you're burning out, if you're frenzied, frazzled, and overwhelmed, you aren't going to be as effective in taking care of all of the other responsibilities in your life. So this is really kind of a, a hard shift for many of my female clients to make because they're so used to putting themselves last. So one of the ways to do that is to break some of the habits that you may have in sort of, I'll call it wasting time or not really effectively using time. And one of them is getting distracted and suck down the rabbit hole of using your devices when you're tired or when you're stressed, it's easy to just pick up your device and entertain yourself that way. And it feels like a break. And while I can appreciate some of the benefits of it in that sense, it also tends to take up way more time um, than you probably have. And then that you don't have the time you need to have good proper self-care like sleep and exercise and nutrition that are more important for ultimately your well-being than more time on your device. So I try to get people to sort of first set up success to have a good night's sleep by removing the device from their possession and hopefully even the room about an hour before bed, plugging it in in a charger station out of your reach and reading or listening to music or talking to your partner rather than being on a device right before bed. Um, it's too tempting to sit there in bed and get sucked down that rabbit hole and then be on Facebook or social media or playing games for an hour instead of sleeping. You also wanna learn how to say no to taking on too much and to over committing or trying to be superwoman, taking on everything and expecting yourself to do it all. It's so important to learn how to delegate tasks as much as possible and to take on less yourself. Get used to saying no when people ask you for one more thing or if you can't say no, saying, well, let me think about it Sounds like an interesting idea, but I got to check my schedule because you want to stop that knee jerk reaction of saying yes, because it sounds interesting or you think you should be able to do it. And so what I want you to prioritize in prioritizing you is planning and scheduling your own self-care uh, each day. So making appointments with yourself to do the practices I'm about to teach you to do. So we're going to talk about sleep, exercise, healthful eating, meditation, body-centered practices, and grounding in nature. So chronic sleep deprivation is the most significant issue among women and men with ADHD, followed by stress management, nutrition, and exercise. Cognitive functioning is adversely affected by the lack of sleep, as well as by stress, improper diet, and lack of exercise. All those things are working against you when you have ADHD. So it's so, so important to really prioritize these. Lack of sleep will adversely affect your executive functioning, your energy level, and your mood. It can also compromise the immune system because it is while you are sleeping that your immune system is functioning and restoring and healing and repairing the body. Disturbed sleep patterns are very common with ADHD. Often it's a delayed sleep phase sort of syndrome where you maybe get a second wind later in the evening, and then often you stimulate yourself with things and you end up staying up really late because it's quiet time and no one's really demanding anything of you. And that whole problem, to some extent, is due to a later release of melatonin in your brain, but also to some bad habits that will be good for you to, to work on changing. Some people also have difficulty waking and they feel like they're in a fog in the morning. So those are the common sleep patterns we see. Racing thoughts can also prevent you from falling asleep. Um, that is often due to the brain being bored. Because there's not enough dopamine in the frontal lobes, the brain is looking for stimulation. And when you're lying there in bed trying to fall asleep, your brain is pinging around trying to stimulate itself. 
So what you wanna to try to do is find optimal background stimulation to provide just enough of stimulation to get your brain to calm down and go to sleep, but not so much that it's keeping you awake. So um, you want to do things like have background uh, music, sometimes a background, a white noise machine or nature sounds. Um, some people can even listen to a rerun of a, a podcast in the background or a story on tape or audiobook um, that they've already read, um, something like that. Audio, auditory stimulation is fine. You don't want visual stimulation, no screens in front of your face. And you want to try not to exercise too close to bed as well, because that can keep you awake. So you really want to make a commitment to getting ideally eight hours of sleep. Some people actually need nine, and some people can get away with seven. But really, when you are only having five or six, it is not enough for anybody or very, very rare people. So it is more important to get that sleep than that extra TV show or movie or Netflix binge or uh, playing on your phone or almost anything else. So leave the phone ideally in the kitchen, that's where I leave it, or at least across the room, but not within reach. Um, and you wanna create a daily routine to support this and really make it a top priority. Um, so if you have a hard time falling asleep, then try the white noise or the background music or nature sounds and try taking melatonin half an hour before bed. Um, there are also other things like Z-Quil is an over-the-counter thing that has some melatonin in it along with a couple of other ingredients, which is different than NyQuil. Um, and you may need to build some accountability. And sometimes if you have a partner or even a teenager or somebody else in the house that goes to bed at a reasonable time each day because they have to get up and go to work or school, you could try modeling your bedtime on the people around you to encourage you to not stay up once everyone else is asleep just to get that extra time to yourself because it's at a cost. So nature is also very beneficial and it helps the brain. Um, research really demonstrated that green outdoor settings appear to reduce ADHD symptoms in children, at least, and to improve their concentration. So it might be useful to build in some green breaks for yourself at work or at home and get outside in nature as much as possible. Nature can be very calming and grounding to an ADHD brain. So if you can get a walk out at lunchtime, even that would be great. So what you eat really does matter. Even though you're in a hurry and you wanna gra grab something, we'll talk about how to do that in a, more, in a smarter way. So too many of us are rushing and just lack the energy to prepare healthy food. So we grab junk food and that's gonna really impact everything about the way our brain and bodies function. So our neurotransmitter levels, dopamine, serotonin, et cetera, are determined in a large part by what we do eat. So as is our energy level and our cognitive functioning. Brain fog, sluggishness, impaired working memory can all be symptoms of a poor diet and or food sensitivities or malabsorption of certain things. Sometimes we are missing enzymes and we don't break down foods very well. So they kind of um, cause us that sluggish feeling or toxins. And unfortunately our environment is more and more toxic with, with all these things in the air and the food and the soil and sometimes in our own mouths. So for those of us in midlife, we have old cavities with amalgam fillings and those leach tin, lead, and mercury. And I've had them all happen to me. So I'm with you on that if you have that experience. And it can actually feel like an exacerbate ADHD. So at one point I had some leaking cavities and I would go into a room and it's like, I didn't even remember why I was in that room. Now that's a pretty ADD feeling, I know but I didn't have that experience before. So as soon as they detoxed me from, I think it was the tin that time, um, I regained my sense of why I went into the room. So it can really mimic some of the ADHD um, sort of cognitive memory issues. We need to eat a higher protein, lower carb diet to enhance our energy and concentration and to increase our dopamine levels. So it's, a, it's really important to have a proper balance between proteins, carbohydrates, and healthy fats. Um, we want to try to eat protein throughout the day because it kind of fuels us and it is how we balance um, blood sugar levels along with fiber. So fiber and protein are the two most important things to kind of have throughout the day. Protein contains the amino acid building blocks of four neurotransmitters in the brain like, um, like dopamine and it's really essential for a concentration diet. Um, many ADHD individuals also have some insulin sensitivity and they crave sugars and carbs. They also crave them because it creates a dopamine pop. So many people are chasing a dopamine hit 
And food is one way that's easy and accessible to do that, as opposed to some, you know, adrenaline pumping activity where you have to go maybe climb a mountain or do something, uh, race car driving or whatever. But this is something very accessible. So many people will look for their dopamine hit with carbohydrates. And we really want to emphasize the importance of at least balancing it if you're going to have some carbs with protein and fiber. So um, when you eat a lot of high sugar, simple carbs, um, so these are the white flours and um, potatoes and rice, uh, bread, things like that, and sugars, of course, uh, any regular sugars, um, cause the pancreas to release more insulin in response to the higher blood sugar levels. And this paradoxically causes an overproduction of insulin and results in a low blood sugar. So then once, once um, the insulin has been processed, um, the sugar has been processed by the insulin, then the sugar level drops, and then you might feel tired and sluggish and inattentive. And then of course, you're gonna to want to go grab some more carbs too and sugars to kind of, uh, kind of activate your brain again, which is a really unhealthy pattern, a cycle of high sugar, low sugar, high sugar, low sugar. Um, so that's the fiber and complex carbs and protein that stabilize the blood sugar levels and sustain your energy and focus rate and also raise your cerebral dopamine levels. So healthy protein choices, if you are um, an omnivore, would include turkey and chicken and lean beef and fish, um, as well as um, more vegetarian sources like cottage cheese, yogurt, stream, uh, milk, um, kefir, soy, protein powder, eggs, nuts, nut butters, seeds, legumes, and quinoa. Those are all healthy sources of protein. So some women eat for stimulation, as I mentioned, out of boredom. Others find it also comforting during a stressful day. If they're bored, they're looking for something to do. And this can exacerbate weight gain, which already tends to happen at menopause or perimenopause. Um, so treating your ADD will likely help this tendency to overeat, especially if you're taking stimulant medication, because it tends to curb your, um, your hunger so that you, you can still eat for the most part, but you're not interested in food in between meals or just a nosh on. Um, try to prepare small serving sizes, um, maybe put them in separate containers like little um, Tupperware containers or baggies, individual sized. Um, so that way you can just grab one of those and not like bring a whole box of stuff or can or bag of things uh, to where you're wanting to take a snack. And try eating them slowly. I know it's hard. You just want to shovel a handful into your mouth. But if you can train yourself to just try eating one, like let's say you ha have a handful of nuts and raisins or even crackers, you know, if you put one in your mouth and chew it slowly and really no, enjoy it and notice the flavor and the texture and the experience and then swallow it before putting the next one in your mouth. It will slow down the process. You'll get fuller or feel satisfied more quickly and you will end up eating less of whatever it is. So another thing that can be helpful is omega-3 fatty acids. 20% of our dry brain weight is omega-3, mostly in the form of DHA, but some EPA and omega omega-6 as well. So it's really important for the brain structure and function. And it's essential for neuronal membrane fluidity, um, which is part of cell communication and immune regulation. It also improves your cardiovascular health. So um, often um, the, the ratio of what we currently eat in our diet uh, is not as healthy as it used to be in the hunter-gatherer days. So we eat way too much of the omegas found in corn and soy. Um, rather than the grass feed fed products. Um, so we really want to increase the amount of the omega-3s that we eat, um, which are the fatty acids in tuna, salmon, walnuts, Brazil nuts, et cetera. And, to, and for some who don't get enough in their diet, taking a fish oil supplement um, could be really helpful. Um, it takes about three months to see results and it's a small but significant effect for ADHD symptoms. You definitely wanna to try to eat grass-fed products too. That will be a healthier form of, of meats for you. Exercise actually boosts the blood flow to the brain and increases serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine availability. It also creates new receptors and new connections in your brain. And, in, and it's a sort of cumulative and progressive improvement. So you're really helping your brain in so many different ways when you exercise, not to mention your cardiac health and physical health fitness. And as John Rady said in his book, Spark, Exercise is the single most powerful tool you have to optimize, optimize your brain function. 
It significantly improves academic performance, test scores, cognitive flexibility, and executive functioning. And there's also a strong relationship between movement and attention as they share overlapping pathways. And the areas of the brain that control movement also coordinate the flow of information. So the best exercises, therefore, are complex and structured, such as martial arts, ballet, figure skating, gymnastics, where you have to pay attention and learn new movements, which engages both systems. But any exercise is good. <laughs> exercise helps regulate the amygdala, which is uh, where anger is experienced and frustration, and improves the tone um, of our sort of hair trigger reactivity center um, and rage reactions and reduces irritability as well. So the recommendation is 30 to 45 minutes at least three to five times per week. John Rady actually recommends six hours a week. That's a hard for a lot of us to attain, but I think it's pretty good if you do the, you know, the first recommendation. The goal is to achieve fitness, uh, normal body mass index and robust cardiovascular system optimizes your brain. So some ways to enhance compliance for an exercise habit would be to have an exercise buddy or a personal trainer where you kind of commit to meet them and go for a walk or a run or to play tennis or pickleball or something you enjoy, or you have a personal trainer coming at a certain point and um, that kind of gets you that structure and accountability um, or a regularly scheduled class that you paid for like a bar class and you don't want to waste your money. So you try to show up. Um, you can also add movement during the day by parking further away, taking stairs, dancing around the house to your favorite music um, is kind of a great way to have fun and exercise. Taking brisk walks, um, playing a fun sport, um, sometimes counting your steps really is um, kind of motivating and encouraging and or engaging in a group activity where you're playing with, a, having fun with a bunch of other people doing some exercise that's fun for everybody. Meditation really does improve brain functioning. And there are a lot, there's lots of research that has demonstrated the brain-related benefits of meditation, both physiologically as in actual structural changes, as well as cognitively. So physiological brain changes include things like um, modifications of the attentional networks, changes in dopamine levels, um, changes in EEG pattern, brainwave patterns, and changes in uh, activities in your neurons. Um, and then there are significant changes found in research on the cognitive um, aspects, like um, you know, even just meditating for brief periods a day, like 15 to 20 minutes for four or five days, had measurable cognitive changes. Um, it produces, so meditation produces a greater state of neural integration. Dr. Daniel Siegel likes to talk a lot about the importance for your mental health and well being of integration. Um, and this is one way to achieve that. It also reduces your cortisol levels, which is um, the hormone produced when you are stressed out. And it increases serotonin, which is the feel-good neurotransmitter. Um, Those levels will increase. It is progressive, cumulative, and permanent, the changes that, are, that happen as a result of meditation practice. It improves emotional self-regulation, working memory, and sustained attention. It benefits your health down to the cellular level. I wrote a chapter that has 36 ways in which meditating impacts and improves your health, mental, physical, and emotional. It improves your sleep and your immune system, and it allows you to get a better perspective on your negative thoughts and allows what we call wise mind, which I'll go into more in a minute, to emerge. So this was sort of a seminal earlier study on ADHD and meditation in 2008 by Dr. Lydia Zylowska. She studied mindfulness meditation for the treatment of adolescents and adults with ADHD. And her research found that 78% of the participants reported reductions in total ADHD symptoms, even though most of them were already being treated with medication and that there were significant improvements on several neuropsychological measures. They also reported different reduction, uh, significant reductions in depression and anxiety. So she has a book on it with a CD with her meditations in it if you're interested in the meditations used in her um, research. So let me define mindfulness meditation for you. It is um, when we become intentionally receptive to our own experience, attuning to ourselves moment by moment. 
So it is that non-judgmental attention being directed to the sensations, feelings, and state of mind you're having in the present moment. It is the repetitive act of directing your attention to only one thing in this one moment. So it's really a brain training exercise where you are training your mind to pay attention to what you're choosing to pay attention to instead of letting your mind hijack you. And this mental training of attention, this voluntarily bringing back your wandering attention over and over again to the point of attention that you are intending to focus on is not a passive relaxation process. It is meant to be an active brain training practice. So wise mind, as I mentioned, is what happens when your emotions and your thoughts work together so that wise action is easy, even when your life and or circumstances are really hard. Um, so you're in wise mind when you can meet each moment of life as it is, not as you would have it be, and respond to it skillfully. So people who practice mindfulness will tell you that they get better at enduring pain, better at solving problems, better at not creating misery for themselves, and better at participating fully in those moments of life that are joyful. So it's about when you are doing mindfulness meditation, your focus is not on your thoughts, on past failings, or on future worries. It's not on self-recrimination or any of the other ways in which we kind of uh, derail ourselves. It is just about fully experiencing the present moment in, in the present moment and keeping your focus on just what you're experiencing in that moment and trying to let whatever thought that comes in just pass by, kind of like a wave might, um, where you think about the wave coming and if there's you know something in the way, it just kind of moves past it. And then, um, or the wind, let's say the wind blows and then the tree or the branch will come back to standing and just passes. So it's kind of like letting the thought pass through you without attaching to it, without magnifying it, without following it, without exacerbating it um, by just noticing, okay, have a thought and you let it move out. That's how you maintain focus on the present moment. And sometimes you have a, a good anchor point in a lot of meditation practices where it could be your breath. It could be an object that you have a soft gaze toward. It could even be uh, your heart rate. You can focus on pretty much anything that's happening in the present moment as your point of focus. So these are all different types of meditation practices. They're all good. Um, you can learn to meditate by attending a meditation class, a workshop, or a retreat. You can obtain auditory guided meditation recordings through some of the masters that um, have developed some of these strategies. Um, Tara Brock is a local um, meditation. She's a psychologist and a meditation, Buddhist meditation practitioner and teacher. She's got a great website with all kinds of free um, guidance on and meditations themselves. So there's a little booklet on how to meditate as well as meditations. There are lots of great phone apps right in your hand. Um, I listed a few of them. Um, and or you can just practice mindfulness um, through movement, even running or walking mindfully or other physical activities done mindfully. You can even eat mindfully or drive a car mindfully. It just means you slow down and you focus specifically on that one thing. Like if you're eating mindfully, you as you bring the food to your mouth, you actually look at it, smell it, you put it in your mouth, you notice the flavors, the sensations, the textures, and then you swallow it. So it's kind of slowing it down and focusing on what you're doing in that moment, not just shoveling it in your mouth while you're talking to somebody or watching TV. So here's a little um, graphic on the benefits of meditation. It's a bit hard to read perhaps, but it does benefit you in so many different ways, increasing your attention span and your immunity and your uh, metabolism and your sleep and your brain functioning and makes you feel happier. As I mentioned, it increases serotonin and dopamine, helps you appreciate life more. And it actually adds more hours to your day because it's a great way to have a brain break um, to actually reset your brain. So let's say you're getting bored or distracted or you're tired of doing what you're doing. Taking a 10 minute brain break by doing a meditation is really helpful and it will actually get you to be more efficient and productive after that. So, um, there are other body-focused meditative practices that are also very helpful, such as yoga, tai chi, and qigong. They will calm and center the mind and help ground into the body. Um, I happen to do both, all, actually all three of those. 
um, they really do help ground you. And, and what I mean by ground you is to kind of get you more in your body and less in your head. That's where we feel the frenzy and frazzledness and overwhelmness. But when we're in our body, it's really grounding and it makes you feel less overwhelmed and calmer. Breath work is very therapeutic too. Um, it lowers feelings of stress and overwhelm. It promotes relaxation, reduces tension, anxiety, depression. It increases your energy and reduces your emotional reactivity. There are a number of different breath work um, apps as well that will teach you good breathing. Um, so you can, you can look those up. A lot of them are free. Um, body scans and progressive muscle relaxation are other forms of meditation. Um, in a body scan, it could be a nice way to fall asleep too, where you actually um, put your brain and your attention, your mind on each part of your body in turn. I usually start with my feet and I notice how my toes feel, how my feet feel inside and outside. So on the outside of your foot, if you're in bed, you might have a sheet over it, or you might have slippers if you, or socks if you sleep in socks, um, or, and then inside your foot. If you actually pay attention, you can feel the interoception, the, the sort of um, the feeling sensations of movement within your feet. It's really kind of cool. And it's also very grounding. And then you work your way up to your ankles and your shins and your calves and all the way up to the top of your head, one at a time. Wonderful practice um, for grounding yourself, calming yourself, and even for inducing sleep. Um, shifting attention to the body and out of the head is really beneficial. So reframing ADHD is so important as a wiring difference and not a deficiency. And this will help you move from self-blame to self-understanding because unfortunately the ADHD brain did not come with an owner's manual. So I try to help create them for people by sharing this information so that you now understand more about how your brain works and what you can do to optimize it. So habit development and behavior change are really important to to remember we talked about prioritizing you with self-care habits on a daily basis. And so it's developing the behavior change behind that that's so important so that you develop good routines for bedtime, for meditation and for exercise, as well as for healthful eating. And then the other aspect of reframing ADHD is identifying yourself by your strengths and not by your weaknesses. So you don't wanna think of yourself as I'm scattered, I'm, uh, absent-minded, I'm forgetful, I'm disorganized, I'm messy. That's not who you are. Those are some challenges you have. Who you are is creative, smart, fun-loving. You have a good sense of humor, you know, all of those things, artistic, um, whatever. Those are all who you are, not your weaknesses. And then um, it's important to learn specific behavioral strategies to compensate for and or improve executive functioning. We're going to go over some of those so here are some fundamental strategies for dealing with inattention. First thing you wanna do is reduce as much as possible the stimuli or distractions in your environment. So you want to have a clean surface to work on. You, and you might even need to go work on the dining room table unless that's already cluttered or some other space if your desk is a mess. Um, noise, so you want to maybe use noise canceling headphones or close the door and try to find a noisy, a less noisy area. Um, you want to reduce visual stimuli, so you don't want a lot of, certainly no screens on. Um, you don't want your phone in front of you. That's way too distracting. Um, and you don't want the email alerts to be on so that you're getting pinged every few moments when somebody, some notification comes in. All of those will help you avoid the risk of getting drawn into a distraction without realizing it. Secondly, we want to amplify the important stimuli. So you want to use the visual cues that will grab your attention to the tasks that you need to remember to do. Um, so some people will have a whiteboard up and they'll be able to put like some key things on there and that will can keep their attention to the important things. Um, you can also use a launch pad to collect needed items for the next day. So that's like an area that you've designated in your home where as you think of things you need to bring with you the next day, you would put them there in advance so that at the last minute when you're ready to go out the door in a hurry, you don't have to then say, oh my gosh, I don't have whatever. Um, my phone, my briefcase, my sunglasses, my keys, um, so that you put everything in one sort of launching area. So for working memory strategies, I try to teach people to do it right away, not I'll do it in a minute or later. And my husband who has ADHD, he has always managed this so that let's say we flip a switch on a light switch and the light bulb um, you know, bursts. 
he will stop whatever he's doing and go get a new light bulb and change it right then and there. Because if he doesn't do it, then he knows he'll forget the light bulb was even out. Um, you also can use um, items as their own reminders. So what I'll do is I'll put out my watering can on my tabletop uh, in the kitchen as a way to remind me to water the plants when I get home. Um, or you can take a reminder with you. Like if you're folding laundry and then you, know, you get distracted with something, take a sock with you to go answer the door or the phone. Um, you can also ask for reminders from other people who are waiting for you to get things done. Uh, or you can send yourself one. Um, don't just verbally, or, I mean, auditorily hear something someone verbally tells you to do. You're gonna have to write it down or ask them to send you a reminder or request in writing. You also wanna highlight important information. Use colorful post-its, mark emails as important, use a red action folder. Those are all ways to bring attention to something important so you won't forget. And then you can put up a note, tape up a reminders or pictures. Um, I agree that sometimes if you've left it up for too long, you don't even see it after a while, but if it's kind of a new bright color and a new location, that might get your attention initially. So learning to use planners and calendars is also essential, as is setting reminders, um, creating a week schedule from a to-do list, and conducting what I call daily planning sessions for task management. So I have people each um, day at the end of the, their work day or the end of their their end of their day, even if they're not working outside of the home, somewhere around just before dinner time, to kind of take 10 minutes and do a planning session for the next day. And what that usually involves is looking at your calendar for the next day, as well as the calendar for the next week or two, to kind of remind yourself about what's coming up so you can be prepared. And so that you can make a daily list for the next day that's doable based on the amount of unscheduled time you have that next day. So if you have a day filled with appointments, meetings, and obligations, you're going to have a shorter list that you're able to get done that day than if you had an unscheduled day with lots of free time. So your list should be doable in that next day. And it's also advisable to take a combination of things, tasks that are urgent and important, that are urgent and should be done tomorrow, but also incorporate tasks that are important but not urgent. So Stephen Covey, who's kind of a time management guru and wrote the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, has sort of two um, dimensions of uh, import so importance and urgency. And so quadrant two, which he defines as important but not urgent, are often the tasks that get neglected. So you want to incorporate some of those into your planning as well, or else it'll become an urgency. Um, and then make yourself that doable list for the next day. Keep the master list of tasks as you think of them in one place, and then you can create the daily list from eyeballing some of those and moving them over into your daily list. Um, using a flow chart can help, and there's some great um, online formats for doing like mind mapping. Um, and you need to really break down complex tasks into parts because parts feel more doable. If you're saying to yourself, oh, I really don't wanna do this, often it's because it feels too big or too overwhelming. But if you broke it down small enough to the point where you can say, oh, I can just do that, that's not a big deal, then you know you've broken it down small enough. And as I alluded to the Franklin Cover Covey planning system, um, after you've made your daily planning list, I suggest prioritizing it according to this system where you put a little one next to the items that are critical, I have to do it tomorrow, a number two in front of the ones that are important, I'd like to get this done tomorrow, and a three in front of the ones that are optional, something has to fall off my list, it's the threes. So here are some other ways to help you manage your ADD through supports. So ADHD coaches are really helpful in developing habits and routines to manage your daily life tasks and self-care if you need to employ one. Um, professional organizers are also really helpful in helping you clear out and organize your home or your workspace at, at the office. Hiring a cleaning service can really be life-saving because it takes so much off your plate if you're used to doing that all yourself. Um, bartering services with friends, like um, some friends are really good at um, coming over and just being there while you declutter. Just having somebody in your space can be so helpful in just keeping you on task and motivating you to keep going rather than on your own. If you're in the middle of decluttering, you might pick up something you want to read and start getting distracted and sidetracked and not really get back to it. And then using online and automated bill paying and financial management software and that kind of thing can be really helpful in keeping track of the financial aspects of your life without all the intermediary steps of having to write checks and address them and you know put a stamp on them and get them into the mailbox. If you can do auto bill paying and manage things electronically, it can be very helpful. So we want to ideally create an ADD-friendly lifestyle. 
You want it to be low maintenance to simplify as much as possible, say no to as much as possible, eliminate and delegate what we call red zone tasks, which are tasks that are really challenging for you. And it could be that someone else in your family or your household doesn't find it nearly as challenging. So they should do those tasks. Like some people don't mind bill paying, other people don't mind cooking. You know, so find the ones that are your green light tasks rather than the red zone ones and focus more on them. Um, you want to find optimal constructive sources of stimulation rather than ones that are not helpful to you. So constructive source might be, you know, some people find reading stimulating or talking to friends or even uh, exercising is stimulating it. You know, you want those kinds of things, uh, you know, you certainly doing a wordle or something can be, you know, constructively stimulating as long as you're not doing it for an hour at a time. Um, but, you know, the unconstructive ones would be, you know, just reaching for food when you're bored or um, spending too much time on social media or um, sort of going, getting distracted by things that are going to kind of derail you or not be healthy for you. Um, you want to ideally create structure and accountability. That's the key for you to accomplish almost anything unless you're intrinsically motivated. So the ADHD brain is generally bored unless it is stimulated and engaged in something that it finds really pleasurable to do. So some people find reading stimulating, some people find um, video games stimulating, but whatever it is that activates your brain, that's what you naturally focus on. So for things that aren't naturally stimulating, you're going to need to create structure and accountability to get your brain to do them. So one way that I recommend is if you want a structure and accountability virtually and you don't have someone in your home or a study buddy or somebody who can get you to focus or a clutter, a clutter buddy, you can also get a virtual accountability and structural sort of accountability and support partner by going on a website that actually pairs you up with someone else who wants to be productive at that time. And the two of you agree to tell each other what you're going to do. You put each other on mute in the background. It's called FocusMate, focusmate.com. Um, and while you're each doing your task, the other person's in the background on mute and you can really focus because you know that it's sort of a structured time. Somebody's sort of there in the background for accountability. And I've had a Naval Academy professor do all this research paper writing that way and found it better than Adderall. Um, so try it, even if you have social anxiety, as many of my clients do, it's not as scary as it sounds. Um, and then at the end, you kind of check in with the person and you let them know what you got done and they let you know what they got done. It can be really supportive and um, helpful in getting you to focus. And you can do it at any time and you can do it for any task. It can be to declutter a closet. It could be to cook a meal. It could be to um, clean or or pay your bills. You just, you know, can sometimes benefit from the structure and support of professionals, either somebody who specializes in ADHD, a coach, or um, an organizer. So what you attend to does expand and gets amplified. So you really want to catch yourself in sh and be aware of shifting your attention when you focus on the negative. So rather than putting yourself down, worrying, or regretting things and I want you to choose to redirect your thoughts to what better serves you. Here's an example of how you could say to yourself, I have to cook dinner, exercise, clean, do laundry, whatever it is. Rather, you know, that's sort of that negative sense of it. Or you can turn that into, I get to exercise. I get to make dinner. Because it is, in a sense, a privilege and it shifts the whole experience of it. I mean, there are people who have handicaps and disabilities or they're sick and they can exercise, they can't make dinner. So try to think about it in a more positive way and that kind of really shifts your relationship to the task. So you want to also shift your mood um, and your outlook as much as you can into the more positive ones like gratitude, appreciation, and joyfulness. And it's a practice. And I try to get my clients to practice gratitude daily and to really focus on the feeling of gratitude, not just a litany, I'm, I'm grateful for this, I'm grateful for that, but actually feel the gratitude as you, as you uh, think about what you're grateful for. And actually sitting in that state of gratitude for six seconds or more releases different biochemicals, including endorphins and dopamine and serotonin that help improve your whole mood and outlook. Returning dignity to women with ADHD. You guys with ADHD are so much more than your ADHD, so much greater than your mistakes your brain fog, your forgetfulness, your oversights, or your disorganization. 
Many of you are highly sensitive, creative, and intuitive, and these are gifts, these are superpowers. Even though you can be easily bombarded by an overly, overly stimulating world, the need for good self-care to remain calm, centered, and present cannot be emphasized enough. You are worthy and deserving of creating time for this self-care, prioritizing yourself. Number one, creating daily practices to be more present with yourselves, more tuned in to your intuition, your gut instincts, your inner wisdom, and your peacefulness, and less distracted and pulled by all the demands and stimulation around you. So women with ADHD too often give up up their power, they lose sight of their purpose and they forget to pursue their passions. The tendency is to take on too many responsibilities and become overwhelmed with the demands, putting yourself last, which then just depletes your energy more. So putting yourself first is the antidote. Making time to pursue your passions and self-care is restorative and affirming and will give you more time. It's not that it's gonna take more time, which is often the myth. Even superwomen need recharging to own their true power. You owe it to yourself and to the world to put yourself first.